<laughs> the message title is Fanning the Flame, and I want to tell you before we get going too far down the road, I'm not talking about the kind of forest fire flames that are happening all over the place these days, and it chokes me up, and I'm not even within, what, a few hundred miles, maybe a thousand from some of these forest fires, but uh, driving in last Sunday morning, the sun is up at this time of the day now when I come, and, and it was a clear day, and the sun was up well above the horizon, but it was just like an orange ball that you could actually look at. It was that, that's how thick the air was from smoke here in, here in Springfield. And today it wasn't as bad, but it was still there. I'm not talking about that kind of flame, but I am talking about the flame of God. Matthew chapter 12, verse 14. The Pharisees went out and plotted against Jesus that they might destroy him. This is what he lived with for three and a half years. They hated him. Everything he did was good. And he came to die for us and for them. And yet they hated him to the point they wanted to kill him. And when Jesus knew it, he withdrew from there, and great multitudes followed him, and he healed them all. Yet he warned them not to make him known, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, that's in chapter 42, verses 1 through 4, saying, Behold my servant, whom I have chosen, my beloved, in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and he will declare justice to the Gentiles. He will not quarrel nor cry out, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. This is, of course, Jesus, the prophecy of Jesus. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoking flax he will not quench, till he sends forth justice to victory, and in his name Gentiles they will trust. The message is primarily centered around verse 20. A bruised reed he will not break. That, that's just a bent twig or a, you know, something that's, that's small and insignificant. And a smoking flax, that's a dimly burning flame. And again, he's talking about people here. He will not quench. To the world, a bruised reed is a worthless thing. And that's pretty much true. Uh, I think Gloria said, did you not have a bunch of limbs down from some storms and stuff? And I guess anybody has got trees probably has had some of that. A bruised reed is a worthless thing. It has no power, no stability, no purpose. It is good for nothing but to cut, be cut down and discarded. So in the world, there are many bruised people, individuals who have been wounded emotionally, spiritually, and physically. They are feeble, and to most of the world, they are dispensable. They are feeble, and they are dispensable, but not to God. Isaiah's prophecy speaks of Christ's tender, compassionate care for the weak and the downtrodden. And he also cherishes the feeble flame, and he does whatever is possible to fan it into a healthy flame of life. Jesus gave us this example. We're to look for any spark of life, I'll call that faith, in another person, and fan that flame with love, with truth, with life, with encouragement, rather than focusing on what is lacking we must focus on the good that exists, that is the life. Now what we're not saying is that people that don't know Jesus, you can't fan a flame that isn't there. So we have to start with a flame. But you can still love people. You can give them life, you can give them truth. But we're talking about now, when you come across a person, that there is a spark of flame of life, just a spark. And listen, through the years, I've known a lot of people that I would say are in that category. I'm not meaning it to be uh, putting them down. I'm not trying to, to uh, make them into less than humanity. I'm just saying the spark of their life is so, so feeble. It's just barely there. And so what I have found can be the case with some people, some Christian people, that is, which is what Jesus dealt with all the time, is they would rather take that, that little bent twig and just throw it away. It has no value. And we're talking about people now. And I've seen Christians in the world that we're living in do that kind of thing. And then those that have a little bit of a spark of life, but just barely, you can ride them so much with legalism and with 
with intimidation and with manipulation that you put the flame out. Matthew eleven twenty nine 29 and 30, what we read last week, Jesus said, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. He said, I am gentle, I'm lowly in heart, and you'll find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy, my burden is white, light. That is Jesus. He has a gentle heart, a lowly heart, and that's what we're supposed to practice. Now, there are times in loving people that you may have to get strong with them, whether it's your children, your brothers and sisters in the Lord, relatives, people you know. Sometimes we may have to get strong in loving them, but oftentimes it's that gentleness, that's that lowly heart, that humbled heart. We're coming to them not as, as the hypocrites did in Jesus' day that were so legalistic that all they wanted to do was kill him. We have the story in, in, in Jesus' day when they brought a, a young lady that had been caught in adultery. And again, we're talking about Jewish people here. We're not talking about somebody out here in the world that doesn't know the Lord. And by the Jewish law, if she was caught in adultery and there were two witnesses, she was to be stoned. That was the answer. Think about what would happen today if we started doing that in the church. I mean, there wouldn't be anybody hardly left, you know. But how Jesus handled that is this. He didn't condone her sin, but he said, those of you that have no sin, let's start throwing the stones. Everyone in that crowd at least was wise enough to recognize that they did have sin. And they just all filtered out and left. They left her there with Jesus. And he said, where'd they go? And she said, they all left. He said, well, I want you to go and I don't want you to sin anymore. What was in her? Well, a little spark of life. Maybe just a dimly lit spark, spark of life. Did he endorse the sin? Obviously not. But he didn't put the flame out either. You know, we're called to love the weak. And I'm going to read some verses to you that Paul gave us in Corinthians and Romans. And much of the instruction of these following verses has to do with something they dealt with back there, and that's eating food that had been offered to idols. This is not really a common problem for us today. I mean, I suppose in some cultures they probably have some of this going on. But in our world today, we don't deal with that, but we deal with something that's very similar in principle. And that is taking this, this world that we're living in, and especially, we're going to be talking mostly today about people that name the name of Christ. Okay? Now, we're not saying that our involvement in this world doesn't involve those other people too, because it does. But a lot of your friends are people that say they're Christian. You know that. Not all of them maybe, but a lot of them are. And so those are the people we're talking about. And let's read what Paul talks about in their day that has application for us today. Romans 14, verse 1. Receive one who is weak in the faith, but not to disputes over doubtful things. That just means their opinions. Now, weak in the faith. We're going to kind of define that a little as we go. But what he's talking about is somebody that just hasn't grown to that maturity to have a deeper, robust faith that they actually know who they are in Christ at the same level that God wants them to have. They could be a brand new Christian, or again, they might be somebody that's been in the church all their life but just never have really grown. In either case, they're weak in the faith. Verse 4, Who are you to judge another's servant? To his own master he stands or falls. Indeed, he will be made to stand, for God is able to make him stand. So what we're talking about is something we shared in a message some weeks ago, but it's about being judgmental. Being judgmental has its origins from the devil. A person being judgmental has no desire to redeem that other person. There's a lack of true godly love and compassion and mercy. You see, the scripture has two versions of the word to judge in the New Testament. One of them is a right one, and the other is wrong. The right one is when the intention in your judgment or discernment about someone else especially is that you desire to heal them, you desire to help them, you desire to redeem them. That's a good judgment. But then the bad judgment is the judgmentalism. And that's when you really don't have any intention to want to redeem them. You would like to snuff out their life. 
Now, I don't know how many Christians would actually say that out loud, but I see it happening. I see the roughshod that some people run over the top of the weak in such a way that they just leave them as a trail in the dust. And I have watched this and I have seen this. And it was happening in Paul's day and it still happens now. Judgmentalism discards the bruised twigs and it extinguishes the dimly burning flames. Being judgmental is a fleshly attempt to take God's place just like Satan did. Now again, God's going to have to show us this because I'm telling you right now, there can be times that every one of us in this room, including myself, probably have found ourselves being judgmental at some point. And when we recognize it by the Spirit, first thing to do is repent to God, and then if we need to, repent to that person. But we say, but they are sinning, or they've done wrong. Well, that may be true, but it's what do we do with it? And are we, are we really wanting to fix them? Are we really wanting to heal them? Or we do, do we just want to put them in their place and then move on? Romans 14, verse 5. Paul said, One person esteems one day above another. Another esteems every day alike. Let each be fully convinced in his own mind. And he's talking about their faith. Again, we're talking about, in his day, Jewish people. We're talking about today, the Christian people you know. Why do you judge your brother, verse 10? Why do you show contempt, which is the word to despise your brother? And listen, I've seen this. Now, can our Christian brothers and sisters do very wrong? Oh, goodness sakes. A lot of times. Can they do wrong to me or to you? Yes, they probably have. What did Jesus say in the earlier portions of Matthew, the Beatitudes? He said, love your enemies. He said, don't do evil for evil. In this case, what he's saying is, what are we doing judging? He's talking about the wrong kind, the judgmentalism. Why do you show contempt or despise them? Listen, we have to be careful with this. And I say we, I'm talking about us in this room, and I think this message applies to all Christians at some point. And that is looking at what's happening with someone else's lifestyle. It could be a whole culture, it could be a whole nation, it could be just a few people, it could be one person. And we can actually be so despising what they're doing, we're showing contempt for them, despising them. And my goodness, we've jumped to the wrong, wrong field then. We're, we're in the devil's camp then if we're doing that kind of thing. Paul said, we, we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or a cause to fall in your brother's way. Now, this is important. This is what we'll be talk, touching on a little bit more as we go. He said, not only do I not want to snuff out their dimly burning flame or take that twig that's bent and just toss it. I don't all, not only want to do that, but I don't want to put a stumbling block in their way. Well, what's he talking about? He's going to tell us. Verse 14. He said, I know and I'm convinced by the Lord Jesus there is nothing unclean of itself. Now, he's talking about the food that was being offered to idols in their day. Again, most of you don't know people that are actually literally going to a idol temple to offer sacrifices to idols. But yet you know people that are offering sacrifices to their idols all day long where you live. Idols. God has shown me on many occasions idols in my own life that I had to deal with. And so we got people that in Paul's day, they there are some of these that knew what was happening there and these people were offering these sacrifices of food sacrifices mostly to idols. And Paul said, really, there's nothing in and of itself that's unclean. That was his faith, a mature faith. But he said, to him who considers anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. You see, their faith isn't developed yet. Yet, verse 15, if your brother is grieved because of your food, you're no longer walking in love. He's saying, if I'm eating something in front of my brother and sister that someone else, another brother and sister, would be offended to see me eat that, then I'm not walking in love. Do not destroy with your food the one for which Christ has died. I want to tell you a story you've heard before. Uh, just, a, just a very simple example. 
my mother and Kelly's mother and dad, uh, they were people that believed in Jesus all of their life and all of my life, I knew them. And so they had standards by which we lived in our home. Some of that could lean toward legalism at times, but dad wasn't so bad about that. He was a little more, uh, I think, balanced about it. But there were a couple of things that were big deals to mom and dad, and one of them was alcohol. You did not drink alcohol. Part of that came from the church world that dad and mom grew up in. It was forbidden. It literally was forbidden for Christians to drink alcohol. The irony of that, of course, is that Jesus himself drank fermented wine. We know that. But yet somehow we, we blind ourselves to that. Well, why did we? Well, because there were so many people that still to this day abuse it. And like where dad grew up down in, in Blue Eye and Lampy and mom grew up in Pro Tim and Nixie, there were a lot of alcoholics in these places, just like there are in the world we're living in now. Plus add to that all the issues of drug addiction and things like that that go on. My, my, my dad had a, an uncle, Grandpa Clark's brother, that was an alcoholic. And he would go to the bars on a regular basis and get drunk and then get in fights. It wasn't unusual back in Protem and then down in Lampy for someone to get killed in those fights. Believe it or not, it was almost like the Wild West back then. And so my dad grew up in that kind of stuff. My mom grew up around it. She was in a rougher place than dad was. They said Protem before, mom, before grandma's family moved to, mom's family moved to Nixa. They lived in Protem. Dad said that was one of the most vile, evil, scary places in all of Southwest Missouri. He said they would kill you down there just for looking at them sideways. And so that is the kind of stuff mom and dad grew up in. So they had a very strong conviction against fermented alcohols, about drinking that kind of stuff, a very strong conviction. And there was kind of a good reason for it, to be honest with you. So here's the thing. As God began to develop Christy and I, and we grew in some faith, not because we just cast off all of the old traditions, which some people are doing that. It's not faith to them. It's just they didn't want to do that anymore. Let's go ahead and sleep together when we're not married because it seems right. Well, that's casting off what God's laid down as, as necessary requirements for life. His requirement for life is not, by the way, that you can't drink alcohol. What it is required in Scripture is not to be drunk. Paul makes that very clear. So as we grew and I became an adult, it became clear to me that it really isn't sin to drink something like a wine or something like that or some people like beer and things like that if you don't do it to excess. Thing is with me, you know me, I tried it a few times and all it tasted like to me was cough syrup because as a kid I had cough syrup, I drank it like, like it was pop because I was all, had these sinus allergy problems. And the cough syrup in those days always had alcohol in it. I didn't know that. So that's why when I would drink something today like wine or something like that, it tastes like cough syrup to me and I don't like that. I have never been able to develop a taste for that. I'm not saying you can't. I'm saying I just haven't. But it would be sin for me to have invited mom and dad to our house to eat and pulled out a bottle of wine even if they didn't drink it. It would have been sin because I would be sinning against my mom and dad's convictions and I would hurt them. And why would I do that? So some people that are Christian people, I've seen them say, they're not going to control me with their legalism. I'm going to do what I do. Well, that's a lack of love. Listen, we don't have to. Paul says in verse 16, do not let your good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God, it's not in eating and drinking, although sometimes we'd like for it to be, but it's righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. He who serves Christ in these things is acceptable to God and he's approved by men. Therefore, let us pursue the things which make for peace and the things by which one may edify another. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All things indeed are pure. He's saying, I know that that food that those people that are offering to idols out here, it in and of itself is amoral. There's nothing about it that's immoral. 
He said, all things indeed are pure, but it's evil for the man who eats with offense, meaning you're offending someone else. Because if that person believes it's sin and they do it, then it will be sin to them. It is good neither to eat meat nor drink wine nor do anything by which your brother stumbles or is offended or is made weak. He said, do you have faith? Have it to yourself before God. Now, now hear this. He's not talking about the essentials to life and salvation. Faith that you believe that Jesus Christ is the only Son of God, that He died on a cross and shed His blood for us, that He is our Redeemer, our Savior. Those are essential faiths. That has to remain true. We're not talking about that. We're talking about what years, years ago some used to call the non-essentials to salvation. We're talking about things that are more traditions, lifestyles. They could have reason to be. For instance, as I said, there's a reason why a lot of the churches where mom and dad grew up, they just outlawed alcohol because they felt like most people couldn't handle it. There's a reason for it. doesn't mean that's actually spiritually true, and it doesn't mean that someone that has an understanding and faith, that there's nothing wrong with that if you don't abuse it, that they can't do that. But what Paul's saying, have it to yourself. Don't flaunt this with people in a way that you will offend them. Gloria tells a story. I hope this is not out of school for me to tell the story, but some years ago she was led by God to attend a Baptist church in this area, and I did for many years. And in those days, more, more so even than now, most of your Baptist churches didn't do a lot of expressive worship, lifting of the hands, clapping the hands, doing the kind of things that, that we did in the Pentecostal and the charismatic world. Today, a lot of those Baptist churches you could go to wouldn't be that much different. But anyway, I think what God showed Gloria, and I, if I'm speaking out of turn, I apologize, was she didn't need to flaunt the fact that she was a tongue talker when she walked in that place. Someone did figure it out after a while, didn't they? And it wasn't because she was doing it in front of them. She, she was not intending to flaunt what it, she didn't need to flaunt. She still had the faith, right? And she can practice that with the Lord and herself and, and private. But why, why, why flaunt it if you're going to offend? There's so many ways that we can offend when we don't need to. But what about things like this? What about, uh, well, I'll get to that here in a minute. I started to tell you, get ahead of myself. I've never done that before. Verse 23, Paul said, He who doubts is condemned if he eats, because he does not eat from faith, for whatever is not from faith is sin. This is one of the great mysteries that Paul taught. And that is, there is one faith, and it comes from God, but that faith is progressively enlightened and enlar enlarged upon. And, and we become more understanding of the faith. Well, how do you do that? Well, you spend time in the Word. First of all, you understand who God is in the Word. And you spend time with the person of the Holy Spirit. You spend time with the body of Christ. And over time, we start getting a better read on what the faith really is. And sometimes what we've thought was faith isn't really faith. It was just preferences. It was just maybe some legalistic uh, traditions of people in church. Romans 15 verse 1. He said, We then who are strong ought to bear with the scruples of the weak. The scruples, that means the failings. And not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good leading to edification. For even Christ did not please Himself. But as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. Going over to 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9, Paul follows up on more of this same theme and direction. Beware lest somehow this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to those who are weak. If anyone sees you who have knowledge, he's talking about someone that actually does have a faith. For instance, in this case, they could eat the food that was sacrificed to an idol. Or let's use my example of drinking alcohol or something like that. If you actually have a faith, again, do you understand the difference? Some people just cast off those traditions because they don't want to do them anymore. That's not faith. I'm talking about something that God has actually given you a faith for. He said, Beware lest somehow this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to those who are weak. 
For if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating in an idol's temple, will not the conscience of him who is weak be emboldened to not eat those things offered, to eat those things offered to the idols? For instance, if in their day, if you went into a, an idol's temple and ate some of that food, he said, what you're doing is these people that you're around, some of them don't have faith they can do that. Let me give you an example. Uh, uh, Big Whiskey is a place here in town where you can go eat a hamburger that's mighty fine as far as I'm concerned and they've got some other things that are pretty good to eat. Big Whiskey. Uh, probably I wouldn't have gone to a place like that with my mom and dad being aware of it. Not saying that I didn't ever go uh, after mom was put in the nursing home in Republic, there was a big whiskey right next door, but mom was not, a, not at a place to really understand. We go eat at restaurants, most of us will go somewhere today that will probably serve alcohol, right? When I was a kid, you couldn't do that kind of stuff. You couldn't go to those kind of places. We, we weren't allowed to go to bowling alleys because they served beer there. And they smoked. That was another one. <laughs> They smoked and they drank beer. Listen, maybe that was okay. Firstly, I probably have lung problems today because all that smoke I was around when I was growing up. Grandpa Clark, he just smoked like a sieve till he quit. But you know, what Paul is talking about here is that I can do something in view of others that I know could have a problem. I need to be kind of careful about that. I need to think about what I'm doing because am I in this just to show that I have a freedom and I can do whatever I want because you know we live in the land of free and the home of the brave and you do whatever you want here in the United States of America and you know I'm being sarcastic because that isn't how God thinks at all. Do we have privileges? Yes. Do we have rights in the way they're describing them? No, we don't. The only right I've got is whatever God tells me to do and that's a privilege. But... I appreciate the land I live in and I'm grateful and I pray for it but you know something I need to be careful that I'm not just being careless about how I'm walking this out especially for my brothers and sisters but you know even beyond them what about these people that don't know the Lord at all if they see me doing some things that they might think well look at that Christian look at what he's doing we might need to think about that some verse 11 because of your knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died. And those are strong words, by the way. Verse 12. When you thus sin against your brother, now he's actually taking it a notch up. He's saying you're actually sinning against them. You wound their weak conscience and you sin against Christ. Man, that's a double whammy. We don't want to sin against our brothers and sisters and we don't want to sin against Christ. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, Paul says, I will never eat meat again. <laughs> Lest I make my brother stumble. Now Paul did after that because he was in places where it wouldn't matter. Today it's not so much eating meat unless you're going to a vegan camp. You know, or something like that. But he said, if it's going to make my brother stumble, it is not worth it. 1 Corinthians 9, verse 19. Though I am free from all men, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win the more. Now this is, sounds like double talk as we read, but listen to it carefully. To the Jews, I became as a Jew, that I might win Jews. To those who are under the law, as under the law, that I might win those who are under the law. To those that are without the law, he's talking about the uh, the Greeks, the, the Gentiles, as without law, though not being without law toward God, I, he said, I'm still under the law of Christ, but he said, I was fitting in that I might win those who are without the law. To the weak I became as weak, that I might win the weak. I become all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. Now, what is he talking about? We have to learn how to plug in with people in order to help them. Obviously, Paul is not implying that we compromise our convictions or enter into their sin. For instance, I want to plug in with my friend who's going to go get drunk tonight, so I'll go get drunk with him. That's not what he's saying. 
But what he is saying is that his instructions are beyond just referring to spiritual things when he says these people, their faith is they're not supposed to eat that meat that's offered in the idol, uh, in the temple. Or in my case, and I keep using this example, for someone that might be offended if I drink alcohol. It's not just about the spiritual implications, it sometimes just comes down to our preferences. Are we willing to go out of our way with our preferences to fit in with somebody else to help them? For instance, things like food, clothes, entertainment, sports, music. Can we fit in with somebody that is a Chiefs fan? I'm seeing a lot of shaking of heads. <laughs> See, the message was timely. <laughs> Can we like somebody that dislikes potato chips? And my answer would be, how could they do that? <laughs> how can you not like what I like? You know, that's how we are. Well, what am I talking about? I'm talking about now how you fit with people. And this is more than just with Christian people now. This is with everybody. You've been around a lot of folks in your life by now, haven't you? We've had a lot of relationships by now. Well, what was my motive in this relationship with this person? And I'm talking about even though you might be working with them or neighbors with them, what is my motive? Is it that I would really like to help them in life? Or is it that I just want my way and if we don't jihaw as they used to say, then we can go our separate ways and that's fine. Because you see, I need to find that I need to go out of my way to help people because for the most part, they won't go out of their way to help me. But I'm going to do what Jesus said. I'm going to go out of my way to try to help them. When I was in the world of sales, which I did that for quite a while, and I'm, as a pastor, some would say I'm still in it, but I pray that I'm not doing it like that. In the world of sales, I was taught you need to plug in with them if you want to have any success with them. And the good salesmen that I have known, and there's some that are not good at what they do, but the good ones... What they do is they learn how to draw people out. They get them talking. You see, if I'm the salesman and I'm doing all the talking, I will probably not have success with them. People love to hear their own voice. And I know that sounds condescending, but it is true. But what is happening when I'm asking them questions, I'm drawing them out. Do I care enough to really want to hear what they say? That would be a big deal. If I'm just doing it to make a sale, then that's not what we're talking about today. But when I am drawing somebody out, I'm, I'm doing what they're probably not going to do with me. I'm asking them questions about them. And you know, that's easy for them to answer, right? Even the hard things at some point will typically start coming. And you're drawing them out. And what are you doing? You're opening their heart up, right? The, the, day, the doors and the gates to their heart, they're opening. And you're giving opportunity for them to share their heart with you. And in doing so, what I will find most of the time is they will begin to trust you. And as I've told you many, many times when I was in the world of sales, especially when I was in outside sales, they called it radio sales, I would go into a, a business and I would talk to an owner or a manager about doing advertising sales with me. And what I would do is I would always start just trying to get to know that individual and then know something about their business because if I didn't I'm not going to do a good job of helping them and what I would find is after a time sometimes just almost the first time I met them and other times a little later we're in this office the door is closed usually and what's happening is at some point they start sharing their life with me their heart and oftentimes troubling things like with their children or something that's going on in their life and they start just really what I would call spilling their guts. Now see, I can handle that because I kind of know what's going on. I don't know what other salespeople do in a setting like that. Maybe they don't draw them out enough for that to even happen. Secondly, I'm believing that most often the reason they feel comfortable to do that with me is that Jesus is inside of me. They may not know that, but that's why they're doing it. And I had it many times that they would do that and then they would they would stop and they would lean back in their chair and they would say, I can't believe I told you that. Some of them would say, I've never told anybody that before. 
Here I am, a guy trying to sell them advertising, and they're telling me all that. Why are they doing that? It's because I'm endeavoring, I believe, with the right kind of heart to open them, to, to draw them out. So as a pastor, this is what I've done forever. I've had people bring people in to see me for the first time. Well, that's sometimes challenging, right? You don't know anything about them. They don't know anything about you. What do you do? Well, you start asking questions. You're plugging in. We're plugging in where they're at. And you know something It's surprising to me? I, I find very few, if, if any, people I've ever known that once you start asking the right kind of questions, that they'll start talking. They will start talking. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 28. If anyone says to you, this was offered to idols, then don't eat it. Meaning that's something that will concern them. For the sake of the one who told you, and for conscience' sake. The earth is the Lord's in all its fullness. All its fullness. Give no offense either to the Jews or to the Greeks or to the church of God. Just as I also please all men in all things. This is a powerful verse. Not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many that they may be saved. Jesus said it this way in John 15, 13. He said, greater love has no one than this, than to lay your life down for your friends. How do you do that? You do that by the way I'm talking today. By caring. By loving them enough to be there, to help them if they need help, to draw out their heart, to be there for them. And he said, I'm not seeking my own profit, Paul said. I'm seeking their profit. And this is where we start separating the, the uh, men from the boys, as they say in the church world, the adults from the children. The adults are the ones that go out of their way to give of themselves to someone else for their profit. Galatians 6, verse 1 Lifting one another's burdens. Paul says, brethren. So who do you think he's talking to? He's talking to the church. Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. Again, that you're, you're not mad at them so much after their sin and you're going to just snuff out that life, but it's a spirit of gentleness. And he said, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. How many times have we seen in the church world someone go to try to help someone and end up going into the same sin with them? He said, bear one another's burdens and fulfill the law of Christ. There are so many times that we're going to have to do that and help. We're doing that right now with a sister of ours, Lori. We're helping to lift her burden with prayer and caring. James chapter 5, verse 19. Brethren, who do you think he's talking to? Talking to the church. If anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his ways, he will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. And he's talking about people that name the name of Christ. He's not talking about somebody out here that doesn't know Jesus. He's talking about a Christian that, that falls in and enters into a sin. Sometimes... In order for that flame to not get snuffed out, we need to help stop them from sinning. Jesus told that young lady, "Go and don't be sinning. Don't, he said, go and sin no more. Jude chapter 1, verse 21, Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. On some have compassion, making a distinction. That's the word for discernment but others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment defiled by the flesh. He's not saying you hate the person. You're, you're rescuing them from going into the flame in such a way that, that in, in our mind it could destroy them. And boy, we've seen that, haven't we? We've seen some people that we know and care about that are getting right to the edge. And he said you need to have discernment. Sometimes, like Jesus did with the young lady that was caught in adultery, he didn't hammer her for her sin. Did you notice that? He didn't condone it either. He told her to quit doing it. But what he did was he had some discernment that he needed to show some compassion here. And she knew he wasn't endorsing the sin. See, sometimes in the church world today, I think we think we, we can help them by endorsing their sin. Well, you don't, you don't help them that way. But you can still have compassion. 
And you know what? If it's real, they'll know it. Maybe they'll receive it, maybe they won't, but they'll know it. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 14. I exhort you, brethren, who do you think he's talking to? Well, it must be the church. Warn those who are unruly. <laughs> Christians that are rebellious and unruly. Can you imagine that? But yet, it does happen. Warn those who are unruly. Comfort the faint-hearted. You know, the ones that are the bent twigs, the, the ones that just have a, just a spark of life. Uphold the weak and be patient with all. Well, you know these words, but let's read it again because love never fails. What are we doing if we're keeping that flame from burning out and snuffed out in that twig? We're just tossing it because we don't see any reason for it anymore. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4. Love suffers long. That means we, we go a long way with people. That's a lot of patience is what it is. Love is kind. Love does not envy. It does not parade, parade itself. It is not puffed up. Love does not behave rudely. Does not seek its own. It is not provoked. It thinks no evil. Does not rejoice in iniquity. That means when you've seen your brother or sister sin, you're not rejoicing because of that. But it rejoices in the truth. It bears all things. It believes all things, meaning it's believing in God in this person. It hopes all things. It endures all things. Love never fails. How do you keep from snuffing out a spark of life in a brother or sister? You love them with God's love. How do you keep from discarding them even if you didn't mean to? You know, it's really easy in this world we live in today to just leave some people in your dust. That can happen at Cox. It can happen at Come to Be Direct TV shortly. That can happen at the Sims of God headquarters. It can happen at Evangel University. It can happen wherever we go. You know, we, could, we can leave somebody in the dust and don't even know we did it. We just trample them down. We're just busy doing what we do and may not even be thinking about them, and that's really the problem anyway. <laughs> Ephesians 4.32, be kind to one another, Paul says. Why did he say that so much? Well, because he was seeing a lot of cases where they weren't. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Philippians 1 9, has be, 1 9 has become one of my favorite verses. You know I have several of those. He said, This I pray, that your love may abound still more and more. Notice, he wants your love to abound and he wants it to be more and more, and this is how it's to happen. In knowledge and all discernment. That's how we love people. With the knowledge of God, and discernment you know I don't I don't want to love someone wrong I want to love them with the knowledge of Jesus and I want to do it with some discernment because like he said there's times you may have to get kind of strong with somebody that's still love isn't it if you tell them the truth in the world you live in and I live in today some would call that hate speech but it doesn't have to be it can be but it doesn't have to be it can be love it's loving them more and more, and it's abounding in love by knowledge. Well, where do we get that? We get it from the Lord. We continue to meditate in the Word and spend time with the Holy Spirit and with the body of Christ. And in that, what's happening? We're getting more and more knowledge. What Paul said is these weak people don't have the right kind of knowledge for the faith. It's not that they are right about what they're believing, but it's that that's just where they are. But He wants you to have and me to have a love that's abounding in knowledge, the knowledge of God, and in all discernment. I love that word, by the way. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 20, 24. Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. Again, you're going after doing that. We're, we're pursuing people to stir up the love. It's not saying, well, I'm waiting for them to come to me. Well, in times, that might be what God has you do. But there are going to be many times He's going to say, I need you to go to them. And I want you to stir up the love. Well, they haven't been very nice to me. Or they might have even said some bad things about me. Or they haven't even paid attention to me. That might be the greatest of all evils. They just disregard me. 
And we go to them and he said, I want you to stir up. Stir it up. Stir up love and good works in them. You know, I will tell you this to be true. I've seen this. We tend to be more like those that we hang around. We tend to be more like them. Scripture talks about the right kind of folks to hang around. Now, I talked in this about this a message a while back that uh, we need to have discernment who to hang around and how to do it because we don't want to be hanging around people that are not Christian and let them draw us into their life. But also, if you're never around them, how are you, how are you ever going to have any influence in their life? So it's the Spirit of Christ working in us with His Word that makes us capable. And so he said, he said, I want you to consider these folks. That's where things really start with love, is actually considering them. It has been said we would worry a lot less about what people think about us if we realized how seldom they do. And that is true. So we don't want to be those kind of people that seldom are thinking and considering the other folks. We need to be considering them. Well, I got a lot to do. I got a lot on my plate. Well, you, you do. You really do. But even in that somehow, I believe the heart of Christ can still come through. Because it said about Jesus, a bruised reed he would not break, and a smoking flax he would not quench. Craig, you want to come and help me, please? Well, Father, this message today is one that in our human flesh, any one of us would say we're incapable of fulfilling. But we there in Christ, we don't have to do it in the flesh. We do it by the Spirit. What is so amazing to me, Father, is that Jesus, through the person of the Holy Spirit, lives inside of me. And He can do anything, and He already has. He can love the unlovely. He can care for the, the fallen and the broken. And He can fan that spark of flame until it starts a bright, healthy flame of life, causing that person to truly have their own faith and strong in their faith. And so Jesus, you live inside of me today and you've become my life, so, so I can do this because of you. I can love people. I can have compassion. I can have discernment on the ones that I need to have a little stronger approach than others. I can be compassionate and caring. I can go out of my way to plug in with them when it may not be convenient. It may not be what I want in my own humanity, but it's best. And Lord, this message today can only be applied individually by the person of the Holy Spirit to each person. Give us grace. Give us grace to love. Oh, my heart will sing forever how the Savior died for me, how he came to die and save me. He forgave me. Now I'm free. And so I lift my praise to heaven. I'm forgiven. I'm redeemed How I love you Precious Jesus You have saved us Eternal